Welcome. If you're still making your way in, come on in. We're glad you could be here today with us. I'm just going to start with um, a couple verses from Hebrews, chapter 13, verses 8 and 15. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. The God of the Bible, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Mary, is the same God today, and we will continue to praise him. So would you stand with us as we sing together?
Father, we thank you for the cross. We thank you for Christ's sacrificial death in our place, bearing the wrath that we deserved. We also rejoice that he didn't stay dead, but that he conquered death. And because of that, we can have newness of life in him. God, as we sing, you are a holy God. 
And we have no right to approach a perfect, holy God on our own merit. But we thank you that in your kindness, in your goodness, you pursued us and you made a way through Christ that we could be reconciled to our Father. God, may that hope bring great comfort today. And we just pray that there would be those who hear that hope and believe that hope for the first time today. That there may be hearts that go from death to life through the work of Christ and the Spirit in them. We pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. You can have a seat. Good morning. All right. Good morning to one person. How about the rest of you? Good morning. Oh, yeah, we got to participate here. My name's Kyle. I'm one of the pastors. And uh, I just wanted to give you a heads up that at the end of the service, uh, the last song, we're going to be receiving our offering. And I just wanted to thank you for your generosity and give you a little highlight of some of the ways that that money is going forward and uh, making an impact. So uh, this fall, uh, our city groups have kind of sought to reemphasize uh, not just gathering like family, but also serving together. And so we got a couple pictures I just wanted to show you of uh, city groups that have been serving uh, kind of around the city. And do we have that? There we go. Uh, just give you a snapshot of some of the ways that people are just taking their faith. See, a lot of the ministry of this church doesn't pl take place in these walls, but as we scatter and gather around the city, the, the, the one on the top left is actually the Rob City Group. They did a winter clothing drive uh, to, to give to those in need, and the one on the, the top right is the Skifstead City Group, who all got together and, and cut firewood for one of their neighbors who was kind of in need of that. Uh, the one on the le bottom left is actually my city group. We partnered with Athletes in Action because Abby, uh, who leads that ministry, is part of our city group, and we provide a meal for a bunch of college athletes once a month. And there's over 70 of them now, which is incredible what God is doing at UMD uh, through athletes that are wanting to kind of learn about Jesus. And we provide a meal for them. And then on the bottom right is the Baltzis City Group. And they visited a nursing home and they brought their kids and they played games and just hung out with them. And so these are just small little ways that we're putting our, our faith into action. And I just wanted to show you those pictures. And thank you for your generosity that makes some of that stuff possible. Uh, also, just a plea from me that if you are here and you've not joined in a city group, it's one of the best things that we do. It's where the church becomes tangible, where you live life on life, where you're able to process the deep things of life, and, and where it begins to start feeling like extended family that you choose. Uh, last week, we had our Friendsgiving meal together with our city group, and I was just, I was choked up at how dear those people have become to my wife and I over the last three or four years. Um, so if you're not in a city group, you are missing out, uh, and you can join them at any time. Most groups are, are used to people just coming and checking things out. There's a wall in the back that has information about that, but you want to join a city group, not just to connect with people, but also to put your faith into action and start serving together. So we're going to take a minute now, and we're going to greet one another. Um, maybe introduce yourself to someone who's new. There's coffee in the back. You're welcome to that. And then uh, in a minute or so, we'll be in John 11 together.
All right, if you would find your way back to your seats. Uh, if you were not here last week, last week was a party. We had four baptisms, and as stories were being shared of people coming to Christ, like there were not many dry eyes that were out there. I bring that up because we're going to be doing another one on December 8th. And so if you're interested or have been felt, felt prompted to be baptized and to make your faith public and stand with Jesus, I would love to chat with you after the service about that, and we can get it on the schedule. So... We'll be in John chapter 11. We've been going through the gospel of John together, and today's story is pretty incredible. So would you pray with me? God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the opportunity that we have right now to quiet our minds, to quiet our hearts, to remove the distractions that you might speak to us. And so God, I ask that you would do that. More than hearing from me, God, people need to hear from you. And so would you speak through your word to open our eyes to see who Jesus is? God, help me to get out of the way so that we can see Jesus more clearly. Speak through me or in spite of me, I ask. In the beautiful name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. When I was in seventh grade, Dave Janish died. He was a classmate of mine, and while we weren't like best friends, I, we played sports together, and I knew him. I saw him every day. He died in a farming accident. And this was the first time in my life that I had to deal with the death of someone up close. So it doesn't take a lot to remember those feelings. If I'm honest, it felt so wrong, tragic, unfair even. What about you? Do you remember the first funeral of consequence that you went to? Not being of consequence because of who it was necessarily, if they were famous or not, but whether you knew them closely. Do you remember it? How did you feel? How did you process through the emotions of that day? What did it cause you to wrestle with? Even yesterday, uh, there was a funeral service for John Ramo, uh, a pastor in this community for a long, long time, and number of people that I look out today were there. It was a father or a grandfather. Well, John served the Lord for years, and probably thousands of people have been impacted by his testifying to Jesus, by pointing people to him. And, and yet even then, with a life well lived, it's hard to say goodbye. It's hard to wrestle with death. See, death is something that we usually like to avoid, if we're honest, but there's times, rather inconvenient times, where it becomes unavoidable. Now, as a pastor, I often find myself in places where I'm forced to ponder life and death maybe a little bit more than the average person. <clears throat> it's not that I do a ton of funerals, but every one of them comes at an emotional cost. <clears throat> See, there's something that I find... <clears throat> so sobering about a funeral. Something that you don't get at weddings or baby dedications or high school graduations. If I could be crass, death has a way of simply cutting through the crap and forcing us to deal with what really matters. You see, we often like to live our life in the trivial Without the weighty things, in northern Minnesota in particular, we're really good at talking about nothing all the time. But death has a way of taking away the trivial and for a, mo a few moments of complete sobriety causes us to ponder the big questions of life. Ones that really matter. What happens when I die? What makes a good life? What is life all about for that matter? <clears throat> Now, as much as they cost to do, I actually like preaching at funerals more than I like preaching at weddings. You know why? Because people actually listen. <laughs> We're all forced to stare at our own mortality and ponder the big questions. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 2 reads this in the New Living Translation. It's better to spend your time at funerals than parties. After all, everyone dies. So the living should take this to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for sadness has a refining influence on us. A wise person thinks a lot about death, while a fool thinks only about having a good time. 
Now, it's not that the good life is spent grieving all of the time, but what the author of Ecclesiastes is trying to hit us with is that the wise, those who live with wisdom, think about their end regularly. They don't avoid the big questions of life until it's too late. A life of wisdom doesn't run from these things, but embraces them and lives life in light of the answers you come to. What's the point and how does it connect to John? Well, we're in John 11 this morning and Jesus in John 11 faces the death of a really close friend, a man named Lazarus, a death that he actually allows to happen for a very specific reason so that we might see him as the one who has power over even death itself. Here's the big idea that we're going to look at today. Jesus tells us, I am the resurrection and the life. If you believe in me, even if you die, you shall live. And the story kind of plays out in three different acts. We're going to kind of look at this as a way of guiding our time through the story. Act one, we'll call the loving delay, verses one to 16. Act 2 is the hopeful grief, verses 17 to 37. And Act 3 is the dangerous miracle, verse 38 to 44. So the loving delay, the hopeful grief, and the dangerous miracle. Let's dive into Act 1. The loving delay. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary, and of the village of, or sorry, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. Now it's interesting here because John doesn't mention that story about Mary anointing Jesus' feet until the next chapter, chapter 12. It, it shows us that the Gospel of John was meant to be read and reread and understood so that you can think about that and actually know the story that he's referring to even though he hasn't written it yet. Verse 3, so the sister sent to him saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and are you going to go there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles, because the light is not in him. Jesus says, Time is short, guys. We've got work to do. There's twelve hours in the day. Let's, let's put something to it. Doing the right thing like healing and restoring life should be plain for everybody to see unless they're walking in darkness and don't want to see it. If they're looking honestly, they should see, which is the big irony of this particular story. They don't. Verse 11, after saying these things, he said to them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he, was, he meant taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. And for your sake, I'm glad that I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. So Thomas called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Oh, Thomas, the ever optimist, isn't he? Now, if you remember back in chapter 10 at the end, Jesus left Jerusalem and we're told went to the other side of the Jordan River. He continued doing ministry, not in the epicenter of Jerusalem, but in this, this wilderness desolate place, which is where the, uh, John the Baptist had done his ministry. And he does that because the last couple times that he's gone to Jerusalem, it has led to a bunch of confrontations with the religious leaders and them seeking to stone him or kill him. I guess that, that's what happens when you as a man claim to be God, Right? Bethany, which is where Lazarus lives and Mary and Martha live, is, is about two miles from Jerusalem. It's on the outskirts or in the suburbs of Jerusalem, we could say. This is why his disciples are so nervous about going there. They know that going there could actually lead to another confrontation and even their death. And so Thomas's conclusion is, well, let's go, so we may die with him. But what actually strikes us, I think, in this story, what is odd is what we read in verse 5. It tells us, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, their brother. 
So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Now, why is that odd? Because we would expect if Jesus cares for him, and Jesus already has the power to heal people, that he would hear about Lazarus being sick, and he would hightail it to Bethany in order to heal him, right? Like, if he loves him, he would want to prevent this death. That's what he should do. That's what we think he ought to do. Drop everything and go heal him. But we read, he loved Martha and Mary and Lazarus, so he stayed two more days. It'd be like an on-call ER physician having an ambulance coming in with someone bleeding out on multiple gunshot wounds. But then rather than going and meeting his needs, continuing with a routine physical. There'd be a big fat malpractice lawsuit waiting for that guy, right? That would be medical malpractice because you treat the urgent need first. And then you move on to the lesser needs, the ones that aren't as urgent. But Jesus hears about this illness and deliberately delays because he loves him. Now, why would he do that? So that he can reveal to us that he has power over even death itself. He says, Lazarus has died, and for your sake, I'm glad that I was not there, so that you may believe. But let's go to him. Act two, we see the hopeful grief now, when Jesus came, verse 17, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. See, grief was a very public thing in their day. While they buried someone almost immediately so that it wouldn't begin stinking and decomposing, there was a, a bunch of expectations that you would spend the next week in grieving and mourning. And, and if you were well off, you would hire professional wailers and musicians to continue this spirit of grief all throughout the week. Which sounds crazy, but maybe getting those emotions out at that particular moment is helpful so they don't come out sideways on somebody else later on, right? And so there's this crowd that's, that's formed. There's these people that are there, some paid to be there, some there just offering their support, and some there because they just don't even know how to put one foot in front of the other. Verse 20, so Martha, when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Perhaps Martha, being the practical one, wanted to give Jesus a heads up on what he would be facing if he went to her home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, the teacher is here and he is calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man, remember that was back in John chapter 9, a man born blind, also have kept this man from dying? Why is this called a hopeful grief? Because Mary and Martha knew who they were talking to. He knew that th they knew that this was not just a man, that he had supernatural power. And so even though they're not expecting a resurrection here, th there's some hope. 
We read it. Every, it's like this line is on repeat. Martha says in verse 21, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Mary, again in verse 32, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Even the Jews who had opposed him wondered aloud, could not he who have opened the eyes of the man born blind kept this man from dying? This is not a group of people devoid of faith. They had seen what Jesus could do, and at least a few of them believed in him. He could do things that no one else could do. He healed a man born blind. Surely, if he had gotten here in time, he could have saved his friend and his friend's family from all of this heartache, pulling him back from the brink of death. Or even if he would come right after he had died, maybe he could have saved him then. Remember, there was a story of Jesus healing Jairus' daughter who had died in Mark 5 and in Luke chapter 8. Or there was a widow who had lost her only son in the village of Nain. And in Luke chapter 7, Jesus comes and he, he, he revives him. He heals him and gives him back to her mother. But those events took place right after his death. Not four days later. Surely his power couldn't be that great. Oh, it is. Why do you think Jesus waited until Lazarus had been dead for four days? Seems like a fairly unloving thing to do. See, we live in a time and a place where death is met with more certainty. We know it often the exact second that someone died. It was uncommon, but it was not unheard of for people to resuscitate after those who were close to them believed them to be dead. So this led actually to the belief among many Jews and taught by a few prominent rabbis that the spirit of someone hovered over their body as many as three days after they died. And then when they were convinced that their body wasn't coming back to life, they only departed when they were certain. Now Jesus doesn't teach that or believe that, but he's, my guess is he was aware of it. Thus the delay. To leave no doubt as to what he was going to do. He was going to reveal himself as the resurrection and the life, the one who holds power over even death itself. But I marvel when I read this story at Martha's faith, don't you? Mary is often seen as the, the one who got things right. But look at Martha's faith in verse 22. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, even now, you can do something about it. I know you can. I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Do, you. do you hear the question behind it? Jesus, you can. You can. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And it's almost as if in hearing that, Martha's countenance falls. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Martha, as her faith begins to wither in her grief, articulates Orthodox Jewish belief in the resurrection of the dead. Oh, yeah, yeah, Jesus, right. I, I get it. He'll, he'll live again on the day of resurrection in the future. Of course. I know my Bible, too. Sorry. I didn't mean to be presumptuous with you here. Probably similar to the sentiment that we often tell people of, we'll see them again one day. But Jesus is revealing something more in these somewhat cryptic words. Yes, that is true on the last day, but I'm going to give you a glimpse of that power now. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who believes in me shall never die. And then these words just gnaw at us. Do you believe this? Oh, I just, I just stated a truth. I just stated who I am. But he asks Martha, and I think he asks us 2,000 years later, do you believe that? Do you believe that now? Listen to her response. She said to him, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. Martha says, I, I believe, Lord, but I'm not even sure what that means. I, I know that you're the Christ. You're the Messiah. I know that you're the Son of God. Come into this world. I, I believe, but I don't even know what that means right now. And then she goes and she gets her sister Mary. Martha, ever the practical one, maybe is thinking, you know, Mary has a way of reaching Jesus that I, I just don't have. She gets Mary and brings her back. And at this point, no one's expecting a miracle. 
They're just grieving together. When Jesus saw her, this now being Mary, weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. In, in this moment, we get a glimpse into the emotional life of Jesus, don't we? Let's not miss that. Because Jesus, while being fully God, was also fully human, and he experienced the whole gamut of human relationships, or human emotions, sorry, human emotions, but was without sin. Meaning he felt all the things, but he felt them in a way that didn't lead him into sin, but rather led him to faith. He did so without sinning, so let's slow down. When, when Jesus sees Mary's grief and the grief of everyone else around, we're told he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. Now, why every English translation translates it this way doesn't make sense to me. It, it makes it seem like Jesus is sad. He's moved. He's grieving. And he is. I mean, that much is clear by, by verse 35 when it says Jesus wept. I mean, every kid who grew up in church and, and had to like memorize Bible verses knows that one because it's the shortest one in the Bible. They're like, Jesus wept. Nailed it. Got it. Jesus experiences sadness. He experiences grief. He weeps because it's the proper response in that moment. This isn't okay. But when it says that he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled, a better translation of that was Jesus was ticked. He was mad. He was indignant at death. The death of his friend angered him. Which should cause us to step back and say, why would Jesus be mad? I mean, isn't death natural? Isn't this just a part of life that everybody has to embrace? No! I woke some of you guys up. No! It's not! Death is not natural. It's the enemy. It is the result of the curse brought about by sin. If you go back to Genesis 2 and 3, God created the world and he created it good and he put Adam and Eve in the garden and he said, freely eat of any tree except one. And the tree that he forbids them is not the tree of life. Meaning they were to freely eat from that. The death was not supposed to be part of the original plan. Death actually came later that they were to freely eat and enjoy life without end. The tree that he had forbidden them was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The, the, the desire to determine what is right and wrong, what is good and evil ourselves, rather than embracing what God says about what is good and what is evil. But when Adam and Eve decided that God was not to be trusted and that they should be more in charge of that than him, sin entered the world and with it a curse. They were ex exiled from the garden and the tree of life and death became part of life. See, in our attempt to cope with death, many people will tell you, it's natural. Death is just a part of life. They might even give you some circle of life mumbo jumbo. But if we are to understand our Bibles rightly, death is not part of life, but rather the result of sin and the curse that death isn't natural. It's not something that we're told to make peace with. It's not something that we embrace. Death is an enemy, and as we're about to see, it is a defeated enemy by the Lord Jesus. Now, if you miss everything else that I say today, make sure that you understand these two things about death. First, death is not the way that it's supposed to be. Kids, upper elementary, I know you're with us today. Know these two things about death. Death is not how it's supposed to be. If you find yourself bothered by death or at odds with death, you're not wrong. It's right to feel that way. It's not normal for a seventh grade boy to die in a farm accident. It's not okay that five-year-olds get cancer and die. It's not wrong to feel the wrongness of saying goodbye to a parent too soon or a friend that you love. Death is not the way that it's supposed to be. And second, death will one day die. Death will one day die. It's why we gather on Sundays. It's why we switched our day of worship. Because Jesus rose from death on Sunday. 
Jesus is the resurrection and the life, and everyone who believes in him will live even if they die. And all who live and believe in him, we're told, shall not die. Now we'll unpack that in just a minute. And as the resurrection and the life, when he is killed for the sins of mankind, he takes them to the grave, but then rises again in victory over this, over them, giving us the prototype of our future. Now back to the story. What, is, what Jesus is about to do with his anger and grief is extraordinary. Verse 38, the dangerous miracle. Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Now, I don't love the King James Version, but in this particular verse, verse it's awesome. It says, Lord, by this time he stinketh. <laughs> Maybe we could bring it back for just a verse, right? Don't open that. He's been in there four days. Verse 40, Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. When he said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips, and his faith wrapped, face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? My, 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 my. They sure did, didn't they? Jesus prays out loud so that everyone who listens knows what's going on. He knows. He's been praying to God. He knew what he was going to do, but he makes sure all of us know as well. We sometimes forget in these stories that Jesus is doing this in a very public way. Now what, now what Jesus has previously said and done comes into completely clear focus. The reason that he delayed was to leave no doubt. The reason that he prayed for all to hear was to leave no doubt. Lazarus, come forth. Now some scholars of the Bible say he had to make sure to, to mention Lazarus by name or with his power all the tombs in Bethany would have been emptied. Jesus, by the power of his word and prayer, calls forth the dead to new life. And Lazarus, hearing his name, walks out of the tomb, still bound up in his grave clothes. Jesus says, unbind him and let him go. So Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. Why is it then that you called it a dangerous miracle? What about that is dangerous? I mean, it just sounds really good. Look at the two radically different responses. Some believed and some doubted. This is why it's dangerous. Verse 45, many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. Yeah, that's the natural conclusion, right? This guy who was dead for four days is now alive, walking and talking and intermi like intermingling with us. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, What are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. D do you hear their argument there? This guy does things that nobody can do except God alone. We should oppose him. Why? This shows us that unbelief isn't always a result of doubt. The reason that they didn't believe is because they didn't want to believe. Something else was ruling the throne of their heart here. What was? Their own political power. Their own political power. They said, if everybody starts following Jesus, then there'll be this uprising, and then the Romans will respond, and they'll come in, and they'll crush us, and they'll wipe out the Jewish people. We need to save the Jewish people. Oh, and, and by the way, they'll also, we'll lose our spot too. Listen to Caiaphas, how gross this gets. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all. Can you just imagine the pompous arrogance of this guy? Just talking down to people, you, you don't know what you're talking about. Listen to this. Nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people 
not that the whole nation should perish. Let's sacrifice him so that everybody else can just keep living with the status quo. Now, irony of ironies. Listen, listen to John's editorial comment here in verse 51. He did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. And not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. So from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. Raising a man who had been dead for four days was a whole new level of miracle for Jesus. And so many who saw it believed. But those who already had their minds made up realized that Jesus was a problem that needed to be taken care of. He wasn't just going to go away. And Caiaphas, in his scheming, actually prophesies about what God is going to do. Let's kill him so that one person dies. And that's exactly what happens. And as Christians, we call that good news. Because when Jesus died, he did die for the sins of the people. When Jesus died and he hangs on that Roman cross, it's not because he deserved to be there. It's because we deserve to be there. And Jesus, in his grace and his mercy, is taking upon himself our sin and our shame and our rebellion. And he is bearing in his own body the penalty for that. God is pouring out the justice that we deserve onto his son as he hangs there. And he takes that sin and he brings it to the grave. And then he defeats it by rising in victory over Satan's sin and death itself, that by faith in what he has done, not by what we do, by faith in what he has done, we actually can be saved. And God is gathering people from all of these tongues and tribes and nations, all of these diverse people, and bringing them into his people through the death of one man. So what Caiaphas thinks is sneaky and a way to preserve his power utterly obliterates his power. And it's the best news you ever heard. Which is why we sing of Jesus. Death could not hold him. The veil toward before him. He silenced the boast of sin and grave. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. Now I want to close with three questions that are popping into my head as I read this story. One, what do I do when Jesus' delay doesn't make sense in my life? Right? It makes sense. I mean, this, this, this story gets wrapped up with a bow, doesn't it? But what happens in life when, when our story doesn't get wrapped up with a bow? And second, why doesn't Jesus spare everyone death? Why is it that he heals Lazarus, but, but many other people died? And then third, what does it actually mean for Jesus to be the resurrection and the life? Why didn't God heal my loved one? Why did they die? Why does it seem like God doesn't answer my prayer for a job? Maybe if you're single for a spouse. Maybe if you're overwhelmed for a break. Let me just tell you, you're not the only one who's ever wrestled through these questions. Everybody has. Every Christian does. When God doesn't do what we think he should. When we pray and it feels like we're in the four days of delay, and it's confusing. What do we do with God's no's and God's delays? Sometimes we don't get the answer that we long for. But we're left with a question, do I trust God or don't I? Do I trust his character or don't I? And at the end of the day, we see that Jesus is not a stranger to suffering and even death, but rather entered into our world, took on more suffering than we could ever imagine, and rose in victory over it. See, for God, suffering is not a philosophical idea. It's a very real thing that he's experienced. Why did he do that? He did that so that he could bear our sin and reconcile us to, to right relationship with the Father. If he's willing to do that for us, then he actually is trustworthy, even when it doesn't make sense. I want to read a, a song from a pastor and a hymn writer called, named William Cowper. 
He was a man who struggled with deep bouts of depression in his life, and he wrote perhaps his most famous hymn in 1774 called God Moves in Mysterious Ways. I just want to read it because poetry has a way of capturing the heart's cry. God moves in a mysterious way, his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. Deep in unfathomable minds of never failing skill, he treasures up his bright designs and works his sovereign will. Ye fearful saints, fresh courage take. The clouds ye so much dread are big with mercy and shall break. And blessings on your head. Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. Behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. His purposes will ripen fast, unfolding every hour. The bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. Blind unbelief is sure to err and scan his work in vain. God is his own interpreter, and he will make it plain. God hold, held William Cowper until the end, but his depression never really lifted. It was something he wrestled with his whole life. When Jesus asked Martha, do you believe? He was asking her to respond to who she knew he was his character. And she says, yes, Lord. I don't even know what that means, but yes, I believe. And so we learn also that even when we don't get a clear sense of what God is actually doing, he is trustworthy and he will handle it. And in time, he will make it plain. Even if the time that we speak of is in eternity, when all things become clear. Which leads us then to the third question. What does it mean for Jesus to be the resurrection and the life? He says in verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Jesus seems to indicate then that when we believe in him, we will die, but then we'll also live. But then it seems to go on to say something contradictory that if, if everyone who lives and believes in him will never die. So which is it? Are we going to die and then live, or are we going to never die? Uh, this is simply a poetic way of articulating to us what it means for him to be the resurrection and for him to be the life. For him to be the me resurrection means he is the prototype of our future. He died and he was raised. And so one day we will die if Jesus tarries in his return, and we will, but then we will be raised with new bodies. And that Jesus in his resurrection gives us a glimpse of that future. Jesus is the resurrection, but we're also told that he is the life, meaning that if we live in him, we find the life that is truly life, that we have eternal life, at least in part, in the here and now. Yes, it's still broken, it's still painful, it's still hard, but our life is no longer primarily marked by death and futility, but in partaking even a little bit of the future that is to come, like an appetizer before a meal, we get a taste of what it means to be in relationship with God. We get a taste of his coming power and presence through the Holy Spirit. We get a taste of, of, of the experience of being forgiven of our sin. And even from, from time to time, we get an experience of his divine healing coming into the here and now and healing someone, even when it doesn't make sense. It's a miracle. And so what that means then for us is that death for the believer has lost its sting and it's lost its power. It's still the enemy. We still rightly grieve when we are separated from people that we love. But now when we grieve, it is grieving in the hope of the resurrection that we actually will see them again someday. It means for the believer, death is just a doorway into resurrection life, a transition into the new and so like the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? It has been robbed of its power for the believer. But let me ask, what about for the unbeliever? The person who has not put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Those who reject Jesus. Well, as clear as I can tell you, you have no hope. Because in him is life. And that life is the light of men. 
We're told in the book of Acts chapter 4, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name given to men by which we must be saved. Because the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord and, and nowhere else. And so if you find yourself here this morning without having put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus, my invitation to you this morning is to believe in him, to trust him, to humble yourself and acknowledge your need to be saved, that you have sinned and rebelled against a holy and a perfect God, and that you rightly stand under his condemnation. But see in Jesus a grace that is overwhelming, that by faith, Trust in what Jesus has done. Your sin can be placed upon him and his righteous life can be given to you as a gift so that you are judged not on the basis of your deeds but rather on the basis of what Jesus has done. You get his resume at the judgment day. Around here, we call that good news. And so if you're here this morning and if you've never put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus, today could be the day. Simply acknowledging your need. And inviting him to be the Lord of your life. Trusting that what he did, he didn't do just in general, but he did for you. Believe in the Lord Jesus today and you might be saved. For those of us who do already know him, may today fill you with a sense of hope and longing for all the things that are new to become sight soon. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word for how it provokes us and challenges us and encourages us and opens our eyes to the, to the identity of Jesus. Would you help us to see him, to know him, to believe in him, and to treasure him? It's in his name that I pray. Amen. During this next song, we are going to take communion together. Communion is the ongoing remembrance and recognition of Jesus' death and resurrection for us. Just like we need to eat and drink in order to sustain our physical lives, so as Christians we are invited to remember Jesus' body broken and his blood shed for the forgiveness of our sins as a way of nourishing and encouraging our faith. There's nothing magical about the bread and the juice, but it reminds us as we look back and as we look forward of who Jesus is and what he has done. See, as we break the bread, we are reminded of Jesus' body broken for us. As we dip it in the cup, we are reminded of Jesus' blood shed for us for the forgiveness of our sins. As we take it in, we're, just, we're saying, I need him still. And Jesus, the last time that he was with his disciples, said, not only do I want you to look back on what I have done, but I want you to look forward to the day in the future when you, I will drink this cup again with you in the kingdom of God. See, this meal is meant to be a, a pointing back and a pointing forward to another meal, a meal that we will share called the wedding supper of the Lamb, the great party of heaven that this is merely an appetizer for. And so as we eat and as we drink, as we remember his body broken and his blood shed, we also look forward to the day when we get the whole feast. And that fills us with hope. And so if you're here this morning and you have put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus to save you of your sins, whether you're a member of this church or not, you are welcome at this table to remember his body broken and his blood shed for the forgiveness of your sins. If you're here this morning and you're, you're not, you're, you're, you're checking things out, you're, you're not at the point of faith, I have no desire to manipulate you into any kind of decision that you would regret. You're welcome here and there's space for you to process through these questions of who Jesus is and what it means. But if that's you, I would ask that you would just remain in your seat and ponder the implications of these questions and claims that Jesus makes. We've all been there before. However, if you're here today and you realize, I need him to save me. Pastor, I think I understand what Jesus did when he died and he rose again, and I need that. And my invitation to you would be to, put, to place your faith and trust in Jesus. And if you do that today, then you're actually welcome at this table to, to eat this meal for the first time in faith, remembering Jesus' body broken for you and his blood shed for you. Let's pray. God, thank you for this meal, for what it awakens in us, for how it stirs faith in us, would you 
nourish and encourage our faith. We thank you, Jesus, for your grace. In your name we pray, amen. During this song, if you would come down the center aisle, grab a piece of bread and dip it in the cup and return down the side aisles. There'll also be a gluten-free station here in the middle that you're welcome to. Would you come as we sing, remember Jesus' body and blood.
Father, God, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts that you are the resurrection and the life. Lord, thank you that death is not something that we need to be okay with. And God, above all, we thank you that Jesus came and he was not just angry with death, but ultimately he defeated death on the cross for us. God, would the gospel message impact us in a new way today as we think about all of these things from your word. God, would you bless us throughout our week? God, would you keep us safe? In Jesus' name, amen. Hello, everybody. You guys can have a seat. My name is Josh. I'm the youth director here at Rock Hill. And we're going to close, thank you, we're going to close here with a couple of announcements. Two quick things first. If you are new with us this morning, welcome. We are so glad that you are here. And one of the cool things that we have this morning is we would love to welcome you with a free gift. So if you have your bulletin, at the bottom of that bulletin is a connect card. And if you fill out the connect card, it's just a great way for us to know how we can serve you, how we can pray for you, how we can get you plugged in at Rock Hill. So you can come to the back there to the Welcome Center. We have a free gift if you turn that in for the first time. And overall, we just would love to meet you because there's some super cool people here and I bet you are one of them. And then secondly, if you are not new with us today, on your seat, you probably saw one of these. This is an invite card for our church on the back, just all the service times, very nicely laid out. And we would love for you to take one of these. We're going to put them on the chairs monthly and just do what it says. You're invited, right? Invite somebody that God has placed in your life to come to church. And I know especially as we're in the holiday season, there are so many opportunities and so many people are willing to come and check out a church around Christmas time and the holidays. So fill out a Connect card or take one of these and invite somebody um, to come to church with you and check out Rock Hill. So the big announcement, the big thing that I want us to focus on this morning is that starting in January, our church, and primarily in the context of city groups, will be going through an eight-week course going through Practicing the Way, which is a book by John Mark Comer, but we're going to go through the course together. And this is going to be huge for the spiritual formation of our church as we learn more about following Jesus and we learn about all of the spiritual practices. And one of the things that will help you in that journey 
is the Companion Guide, the Practicing the Way course Companion Guide, which goes with this course, which you can order for $10, limited time sale. I'll get to that in a second. You can order that on our website. So two big things with that. Number one, if you are not in a city group, city groups are incredible. Like Kyle said at the beginning, I love my city group so much. I don't know where I would be without them. So if you're not in a city group, you should join one. You should be in community. It's amazing. We have a city group board back there in the corner. It's a big thing that says city groups on it. Go back there. One of us will be back there to chat about it. There's cards with all the city groups. We'd love to get you plugged in to community. So number one, if you're not in one, think about it. Pray about it. Number two, if you are in a city group, consider buying this companion guide as we start this eight-week course in January. You don't need the companion guide, but it will provide you with a ton of super helpful resources and good information and just a place to keep everything and take notes as we go through this course. And the special price of $10 we have, you can order that online on our website for $10. That sale will end on December 1st. So if you're interested in ordering that, you can order it online or you can talk to your city group leader and they can help you with that as well. And with all of that stuff, on our website, you can find info on city groups and on this course and the companion guide at rockhillcc.org. And lastly, because I'm the one up here, youth group students, we have our Thanksgiving events tonight, which are going to be incredible. We have our Friendsgiving Thanksgiving event over in Superior, and then our Thanksgiving banquet for high school will be right here at a special time, 6 to 8.30. So we're starting and ending a little earlier, a little bit later um, with that. So youth group students, you can come enjoy a Thanksgiving feast tonight. And since this is the 1045 service, if you guys want to help at the end, we're going to move the chairs to the sides. And then youth group boys, we're going to get some tables. Youth group girls, there's strong ones here too. You can do that. We're going to have tables downstairs. You can help us to bring those up and get set up here. So those are my big announcements for you guys. Thank you so much. We're going to have a prayer team up here. We would love to pray for you, whether big or small, whatever you're going through. Let's lift that up to the Lord together. You guys can stand up. Now you are not dismissed, but you are sent out to declare, display, and delight in the gospel of Jesus. Thank you.